currently at the Brandenburg College, formerly the beloved associate director of Dimax, who did so much, and he's sorely missed. It's nice to have him again. If you'd like to join us for dinner, please let me know right after the talk. All right, thank you. And it's good to be back. Um, and actually, um, I will get to my, my talk today. This is actually some recent work that was done, uh, actually all of it for that matter, was done while here, or at least began while here at, at uh, DIMAX. Uh, I'm going to try to see if this, no, that's, okay. But before we get to that, <laughs> uh, I just wanted to do a quick announcement. Uh, we just found out um, a couple of weeks ago, actually, that Muhlenberg is going to be hosting um, the first RU at Muhlenberg ever. Uh, and it actually uh, is on the OEIS, so research challenges of identifying integer sequences using the OEIS. Um, and it's not only the first uh, RU site at Muhlenberg, it also, I'm told, is the first RU sponsored by the NSF specifically for the OEIS or researching the OEIS. Uh, and I, again, I just wanted to share a few comments. I don't know how ethical this is, but the reviews actually were very positive. And, uh, uh, they, they said uh, that it was a very original idea, uh, give students the opportunity to see all that is math, how, yeah, see that all math is connected. Uh, and they thought there was a high potential for innovations coming from many directions. Uh, and so I just wanted to start off today by thanking, actually, Dr. Zalberger and, of course, Dr. Sloan. Uh, because I don't think this would have come to be without uh, the OEIS conference and, of course, uh, Dr. Zeilberger coming to my office with the idea. Uh, and, of course, Dr. Sloan having more than a passing association with uh, OEIS. Uh, so I just wanted to say publicly thank you to the two of you. I think, uh, Dr. Zeilberger, that was one of the best ideas that ever came through my office when I was over at uh, uh, DIMAX. Um, and Dave's had a good job. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so now uh, we are going to have uh, a program there, and uh, unfortunately what I'm going to talk about today has very little to do uh, with the OEIS. Um, actually, uh, there are three recent results over the last uh, couple of years or so. Um, one of these has already been published, uh, two, which, believe it or not, grew out of initially REU projects here at DIMAX and have since taken on a life of their own uh, and are still in sort of um, the, the preliminary stages, one a little bit more than the other. Uh, but I'll simply go through each of these today um, and I'll start with some basic definitions and terms. And I, I just wanted to say uh, in some of the communications back and forth, I was told to basically start at the beginning. I'll try to run through these as quickly as I can. I also want to apologize for some of the pyrotechnics that you're going to see. I gave sort of a cruder version of this talk a few months ago uh, at a teaching institution where they wanted, the faculty had wanted to see some research, but they weren't sort of up on some things. Uh, and so there are a few pyrotechnics going on. My apologies. I borrowed some of the slides from that talk. Um, nevertheless, uh, just starting right at the very beginning, um, in case there's anyone unfamiliar with a graph, um, basically we're defining it as an ordered pair, uh, where um, the ordered pair comprises a set of vertices or nodes together with a set of edges or arcs. Um, uh, we can then define the order of the graph as the number of vertices, uh, the size of the graph, the number of edges. We basically say an edge is incident to a vertex if that vertex is an n vertex for the edge, an endpoint for the edge. Um, two n vertices are said to be adjacent. Um, and then, of course, we can talk about, if you will, the multiplicity of an edge. Um, basically, two vertices, uh, it's possible for two vertices to have multiple edges. Uh, and, if you will, the number of edges sharing the same n vertices uh, is referred to as the multiplicity of that edge. Today, we're going to talk mostly about simple graphs. Uh, uh, which basically is a graph in which there is at most one edge between any pair, any uh, of vertices, uh, with no loops uh, as well uh, with simple graphs. Um, okay, 
Subgraphs, uh, again, just sort of a you know, quick example. Uh, subgraph, a general subgraph of a graph G. Uh, the vertex set of the subgraph is, of course, a subset of the vertex set of G, and likewise with the, the edge set. Um, edges, of course, both vertices uh, and vertices need to be uh, in the subset of vertices for the subgraph. Um, again, very quickly, the degree of a vertex is the number of edges incident with that vertex. Um, a complete graph a complete, is a simple graph in which every distinct pair of vertices is joined by exactly one edge. Uh, again, uh, a lot of this really, I don't think, is new to anybody. Uh, we define walks as a sequence of alternating vertices and edges. Uh, a walk is closed if the last vertex is the initial vertex. Uh, it's open otherwise. Uh, the length is the number of edges used. If the edges are distinct, we refer to it as a trail. Again, if it's closed, it's a tour or a circuit. And a path is both edges and vertices distinct. And again, if it's a closed path, uh, it's referred to as a, a cycle. Um, because they tend to crop up uh, and um, get a lot of use in graph theory, uh, paths are usually denoted as P sub n, the size of the path, and C sub n, uh, the size of the, the cycle. Um, all right, the complement of a graph, and here we get some of the initial pyrotechnics, uh, basically is the same vertex set and the complement edge set, right? So the red would be the original graph, right? The green is uh, the set of edges that we're missing, of course, and um, what kind of, sorry. Uh, like I said, a few months ago, I had a little bit more time on my hands. <laughs> so quickly moving on, right? So the complement is simply, um, uh, if you will, the missing edges from the, the graph itself. Uh, the girth is the, the length of the shortest uh, simple cycle. The circumference, the length of the largest cycle. Um, the diameter, uh, and of course I'm talking in this point, at the point, although I haven't introduced it yet, uh, about connected graphs, um, right? If they're disconnected, then we start talking about, um, you know, the diameter uh, being infinity. Um, so the diameter of the graph uh, is the length of the longest path. Um, a path is said to be Hamiltonian if it uses all vertices exactly once. Um, and a graph that contains a Hamiltonian path is a Hamiltonian, or I'm sorry, Hamiltonian cycle is a uh, Hamiltonian graph. Likewise, it's Eulerian if it uses all edges exactly once. Um, and a graph that contains an Eulerian trail, of course, is said to be traversable. Um, again, uh, we talk about uh, graphs being isomorphic. Uh, again, for those of us that the, the diagram, of course, is not the graph. Um, we're more interested, of course, in the structure of this. And so two graphs are said to be isomorphic if there's a one-to-one -one correspondence um, uh, between both vertices and edges that preserves adjacency. Um, Do you mean, is there a typo on that? The fourth button? Yes. Bullet, the fourth bullet. The fourth Should it say a trail is your... Is Yes. Eulerian instead of a graph is Eulerian? Yes, a trail is Eulerian. Thank you. Yes. Um, I've been telling my students this year, since I do a lot of my notes on PowerPoint, um, it's sort of it's like finding Waldo. Where's the typo? So we, we give extra credit points. Yes, you're correct. No, but if graph is Eulerian if it has an Eulerian type. No, but the first sentence of the fourth bullet. Okay. The graph is Eulerian. If it uses all the oh, yeah, yeah, right. so yes, yes, yeah. it yeah. should be a trail. Correct. It can so, be done if it, if it has a trail and it uses all the edges of one. Yes. <laughs> so yes, no, I, yeah, it should. Right. <laughs> so the, the, we, it's an Eulerian. You're right. It's an Eulerian trail that we're talking about. Let's move on. <laughs> A uh, few more terms. Um, vertices are connected if there is a path uh, connecting the vertices, joining the vertices. Um, a graph is connected if every distinct pair of vertices um, are connected. Uh, a component of a graph 
uh, or it's a subgraph in which any two vertices uh, are connected to each other by paths uh, and uh, not connected to any additional vertices in the larger graph. Um, a K clique is a complete subgraph uh, within the graph. A maximum clique is a clique that is not a subgraph of any other clique. Uh, we say that it is k-connected if the smallest number of vertices needed to be removed to disconnect the graph is k. Uh, vertices or edges? Uh, yeah, I, I use k-edge connected when I'm talking about edges. Um, and if I just say k-connected, I mean, that's the terminology I, I use. Um, so for me, the, the vertex is implied. Okay. Um, and so, if we're talking about an acyclic connected graph, of course, this is referred to as a tree. Sometimes, I suppose, if we're, we're looking at uh, particular uh, applications or uh, particular problems, uh, we distinguish one vertex, or sometimes one vertex is distinguished as a root of the tree. Uh, if we're looking at a tree that um, is a spanning subgraph, so it contains, basically the tree covers, if you will, all the vertices of the graph. It's referred to as a spanning tree. Uh, and a tree that is acyclic, um, in other words, it's not connected, uh, is called a force. Uh, so again, these are all just sort of um, basic terms. Uh, the neighborhood of a vertex is the set of all vertices adjacent to that vertex. Um, I don't think we're going to use this, but a planar graph is one that can be drawn on the Euclidean plane without any crossing. So, sort of a simple example, again, a little pyrotechnics here, right? You can redraw that edge. So, I turn it into a, a planar graph. Uh, so, a trivial example. I should work. Yes, correct. Um, one of, well, a couple of the examples I'm going to look at use uh, directed edges and therefore directed graphs. So a directed edge uh, is an ordered pair of end vertices that we represent graphically um, by an arrow. So of course a directed graph is one in which all the edges are directed. Uh, this is also of course called a digraph or a directed network, right? And so we then um, in a sense would have the ordered edge um, BA, for example. Uh, and a couple of the problems I'm looking at today uh, use directed graphs. And so at that, um, the first problem that I'm looking at today actually is not in the title of the talk, but I thought it would be nice to start with this. This was something that uh, actually was published about a year or so ago. Um, this was actually a um, study that I did with a colleague. Uh, we were asked to basically analyze the Hudson River uh, food web. Um, and so there were other things involved in this, but we did use for a piece of it um, some graph theory. So it did involve some statistics and some other analysis. Uh, but just to give you an idea of, in a sense, how we could use graph theory uh, with something like this. Um, basically, the Hudson River uh, system is home to a diverse uh, population of uh, fish, birds, uh, other small mammals and such that cohabit uh, the area and compete for resources. Um, and so actually what we did here was we looked at four different food webs. Uh, we divided it into marsh areas, brackish areas, freshwater channel, and freshwater shallows. Right. This actually was just one of the examples uh, of this, I believe, is the freshwater shallows example that we looked at. And you'll notice that there are directed edges. Uh, and so a food web is a digraph. And generally, the, the customary practice is to have the arrow go in the direction of energy, or at least that's the way I think of this. So that you know the, the fish are eaten by bear, so the arrow goes from the fish to the bear. Um, and so we, you can also you notice there's a different sort of thickness to the arrows. And so you can, if you will, assign a weight 
uh, to each directed edge. Uh, in terms of, there's any number of ways you could assign the weight. You know, how much the dominant species depends on this food source. Um, and so it gives you some sense of how stable, how robust the, the food web or the, the, the habitat is. Um, and so we were interested in studying the trophic status of these four different um, areas, these four different food webs, and sort of comparing, you know, is one more stable than the other? What happens if a species disappears? Obviously there was crossover species, right? Species that uh, would exist in more than one of these food webs, and there are species that exist particularly to that one uh, food web. And so actually, like I said, there were a number of different analyses that we did with this. But sticking to sort of the graph theoretic component, uh, one way that you can analyze the robustness of uh, an ecology is by using a measure of what we call connectance. Right? Uh, and I'll get to a definition of connectance in a second. Uh, and again, I believe this is the freshwater shallow um, food web. And so you can actually can take a look at the species. Divide each of the species into what are called top species. So these are species with no predators, basically. Um, basal species, these are species with no prey. So basal species basically, if you will, are at the bottom of the food web. Yes. Like water celery. Yes. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but because they're at the bottom, because they have no prey, does not mean they aren't important, uh, or that they, they're simply there to be consumed by other species. <laughs> and then, of course, intermediate species, which have both predators and prey. Um, and so, studying, I mean, why would we want to study the robustness? Um, well, of course, with, um, well, rapidly increasing habitat modification. You've got development coming in, uh, you've got uh, native, non-native non species coming in, you know, how is this impacting uh, the environment? And nowadays, I mean, when we talk about issues of sustainability uh, and uh, available resources, uh, changes to habitat happen much more rapidly. And so how robust is an ecology to some of the changes that are taking place? And so like I said, uh, there are several ways that we can measure this robustness. For the purpose of today's talk, uh, the one I'm going to use is connectance, uh, which is relatively common with ecologists. And so basically, thinking of this direct graph, the connectance is going to indicate the proportion of all possible interactions within a binary food web. A binary meaning, you know, species A is eaten by species B. Um, species A could eat itself, so we are allowing, if you will, for cannibalism, uh, and we're allowing that species A eats B and B eats A. So we could have sort of this two-cycle symbiotic relationship. Did it happen to nature? Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> and so initially, um, if I use L for simply the number of links, if you will, the number of edges or connections between the species, and S will be the number of nodes, the number of species. Uh, then, when I allow cannibalism and what I'm calling this two-cycle feeding, there's an S-squared maximum number of possible interactions, right? Because every species can eat every other species, and it can eat itself. And so it's a simple proportion, um, the connectance in this case, is L over S-squared. But of course I want to refine this a little bit. And so if I remove cannibalism, in a sense, what I'm doing is removing the loops from this directed graph. Uh, and so it becomes L over S times S minus 1. Finally, of course, if I remove both cannibalism and two-cycle feeding, um, then, of course, I get 2L over S times S minus 1, right? You get L over S choose 2. Um, and so concentrating just on this scenario, so let's just assume that we can ignore cannibalism and two-cycle feeding. Um, then I can actually analyze this a little bit. Um, if I want to link all species, so I want a connected digraph, so to speak, then the minimum number of links I can have, of course, is S minus 1. 
Um, and so, in that case, this, connect, this connectance, which I'm now going to call C sub s, just for this particular case, uh, the minimum value is going to be 2 over s. On the other hand, the maximum number of links I can have, of course, is s choose 2, right? It's possible to have, uh, uh, in a sense, if you will, a complete graph if I ignore the, the edges or the directions for a second. Uh, it then sort of tells me that the maximum value is 1, right? And so the connectance is going to be some value between 2 over s and 1. And of course, the closer I get to the maximum value, the more robust the, the ecology is going to be, the more robust the food web is. Now actually what I want to do is compare the robustness between my different uh, ecological divisions uh, that I have. And so I want to sort of normalize this, right, so that I can make this sort of comparison. And so this last expression down here uh, is simply uh, a normalization process that I'm using for the connectance. Uh, and just to give you a quick um, feedback on some of the data, right, so my four different areas, we had the number of species, the number of links in each that we got from the, the data sets. Um, and then, of course, the, the connectance. And uh, I don't know if you can read that. It's the minimum connectance value, and then, of course, the normalized. And so the comparisons that I want to make down here is in the last row. That's what I want to look at when I'm comparing the, the different uh, uh, ecologies. Um, and so basically, again, I, I don't want to get into any of the statistics that we did, but some of the conclusions that we came to uh, was that basal species Traditionally, we think of them as weak species, right? They're at the bottom of the food chain. But actually, they tend to be very critical. Um, and along with maybe some of the lower so, so species. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes. So in, in fact, yes. So if you remove them, in a sense, the, the system collapses. I mean, it, it may sound obvious to us, but uh, it wasn't always obvious. Um, and so yes, they, they play a crucial role in giving the food web um, some stability, some robustness. Uh, in comparing some of these, um, the, the freshwater channel appears to be the most sensitive to changes. So introducing non-native species or removing certain species, that tended to be far more sensitive than, than the others. Whereas the brackish um, system tended to be the least sensitive uh, based on our analysis. Uh, we weren't really able to make any comparison between marsh and freshwater shallows. We didn't get any significant results with those. Um, but it did, our findings did suggest that um, highly connected species are not always the intermediate species. That you would, again, you, you might think because they're kind of, if you will, in the middle of things, in the thick of things, uh, they would be perhaps, um, if you will, the most important when it comes to connecting the the ecology, but in fact they weren't necessarily. Um, and species which are traditionally thought of as weak species, the basal species, um, also um, tended to be more significant than people thought. Uh, and so yeah, these were just some of the conclusions. And again, I just wanted to start with this to give some indication of you know, how you can kind of use some simple graph theoretic concepts uh, uh, you know, to some kind of a consulting scenario. Did you give a name to the species that are connected to the basal species? You could call them vegetarian oh, species. Oh, yes, uh, yes. No, we didn't, but that's, I, yeah, I like that idea. Uh, so yes, uh, we, we didn't think about that, but uh, you're right. Uh, that definitely would make sense. Do you recycle three? Uh, does that exist in nature? It does. We didn't necessarily take it into account with this particular uh, environment. But yes, it does exist in nature. Um, and actually, uh, if you go back, um, I would say back to the 60s and 70s, when we were first beginning to think about how do we, if you will, protect the environment or, or deal with the environment, the, the thinking back then was to simply introduce another species into the environment to take care of a non-native species that tended to be very aggressive. That created far more problems than it created, and that I bring, bring that up because that was where you got some of these cyclical um, uh, processes go, or you know eating systems going on 
uh, the one I keep, I grew up in northern Pennsylvania, so the one I always think of is the, um, the gypsy moth, uh, which uh, anybody that is around my age and grew up in that area, North New England, uh, mid-Atlantic states, at that time you would look in, up into the mountains and they would just, in a sense, be clear-cut from the gypsy moths uh, eating them. A predator of the gypsy moth is this sort of little gnat, this kind of little wasp, um, and you may see them at certain times of the summer. You know, if you're, you know, as a kid, I would be driving or riding my bike, and then you just get hit in the face with these things. And they would eat the eggs of the gypsy moths, and they thought that would sort of balance it out. They couldn't have been more wrong. Uh, so they, they, I don't think we introduce new species anymore, uh, or try not to. Uh, so, yeah, so anyway, that was kind of just an interesting uh, side trip for, for us. But the next one uh, was a joint work with, it started out with an RVU student, C.J. Burbeck, who is now a grad student uh, at Princeton, and Vin De Silva, who's uh, now at Pomona College. And this actually uses the idea of pebbling. Uh, and actually, the RVU project didn't start out anything like this. It was a completely different problem, and just again as these things develop, uh, we zigzagged our way through, and before we knew it, we were working on this. Um, we actually have published this, or an earlier draft of this, as a tech report. Um, we've been holding back just because we're hoping to get some more significant results. And there are some interesting open problems with this that I'm throwing out here that anyone, is, if they're interested, certainly can work on. But graph pebbling actually had its start right here at Rutgers uh, with our own Dr. Sachs and Ligarius, who um, basically suggested this as a tool for solving some problems in number theory. Uh, it didn't take long for it to take off. Um, it really is thought of as a mathematical game played on a simple connected graph with pebbles, right? So you have an arrangement of pebbles. And what constitutes or what consists a pebbling move? And so in order to basically move pebbles, uh, you need to have at least two located at a vertex. Uh, and then, for the move, you basically remove one pebble, more pyrotechnics, and then the remaining pebble moves along one of the edges incident with the vertex. I've always thought of this as sort of the cost of making a move. The cost to move a pebble from one vertex, vertex to another is one pebble, basically. Uh, and so, of course, this brings up, and I should say, since the initial inception, there are variations on this. They, they've changed, you know, if you will, the cost of moving. So what if it costs two pebbles to move, or, or you know, what if you change what you mean by a move? Uh, so there are some variations on this. A lot of the work, and I think I've got it on one of the later slides, is by Herbert, who actually did his PhD here at um, Rutgers as well. And I think, if I remember correctly, he's at Arizona? Somewhere in Arizona, I think. Someplace in Arizona. He, he maintains a... Hulbert, H, I've got it on the next slide. H-U-R-L-B-E-R-T. He maintains, or he used to maintain, a pebbling page with most of the, the latest results. Um, and so, uh, I believe it was Von Chung who actually came up with the concept of a pebbling number. And so given any target vertex in G and any initial configuration, what we mean by the pebbling number is the smallest value n for which a series of pebbling moves. A new configuration has at least one pebble on the target vertex, right? So we're trying to get to this vertex. And so the pebbling number is that number of pebbles to get to any target vertex. Um, and so, yeah, Fan Chung was the one that uh, introduced this concept. Um, and so, obviously, you can say the pebbling number for any such graph has to at least be the order of the graph, right? You need at least as many pebbles as vertices. Because you can obviously do an arrangement um, if you have fewer than n pebbles. You can just put one pebble uh, on uh, each vertex with, of course, a couple of vertices without a pebble. There's no way that you can make a move if this is the target vertex. 
So obviously, the pebbling number has to be at 